The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 122. One day, I shall come back. And that's it. I've been renewed. It's when a Time Lord's body wears out, he regenerates. I'm a Time Lord. I'm not a human being. I walk in eternity. Brave hearty. Change, my dear. And it seems on a moment too soon. Unlimited vice pudding! Position, you know, sir. Wearing a bit thin. Fantastic. Rousey! I am Scottish. I can complain about things. Ta da! Should be fine. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series Doctor Who. And today is the one we've been waiting for for a long time. One of the best episodes of Doctor Who, in my opinion, and that of a lot of folks. Uh, so like, you're saying it's not Vengeance on Varos. <laughs> it is not no. Vengeance on Varos or pretty much anything so far that the Sixth Doctor has done. Uh, no, this is, we're talking about the 10th Doctor episode, Blink. Yes, the Weeping Angels mm. are here. Uh, th- thankfully, we are a podcast, not a video, so you don't have to see them on the screen and worry about them coming through it. You can listen to the podcast and keep your eyes open at the same time. Yep. <laughs> That's right. So, so Dom, you're not, you're not going to put uh, the Weeping Angel as the uh, album art? Oh, you know I am. <laughs> <laughs> I figured as much. <laughs> because the uh, evil laugh. <laughs> Uh, so, as, yeah. as always, and of course, joining me on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? So, folks, remember to like The Secrets of Doctor Who on our Facebook page. Uh, we have a Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page. Please find it on Facebook. Just search for it in the search bar and you'll find it. And retweet us on Twitter, where we're at SQPN. Leave us comments. Subscribe in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Tune in your favorite podcast app or YouTube, where you should hit the bell to get notifications. And above all, share the podcast with your friends. Your, your Doctor Who friends want to hear us talk about Blink. And uh, so well, share it with your friends and help us grow this community of Doctor Who fans and reach more listeners. All right, so let's get into this discussion. Uh, this is a 2007 episode of Doctor Who. It was broadcast in June of 2007. So that's the Martha Jones year. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. Third season. Featuring David Tennant as the as the Doctor. Tenth Doctor, yes, David Tennant. Written by Stephen Moffat, who would later, as we, all Doctor Who fans pretty much know, would become the showrunner. But this was one of his earlier scripts. And in fact, one of the interesting aspects of this is this was a, a sort of last minute script. Mm-hmm. Uh, Moffat mm. had promised to do a a, a bigger two part epi- uh, episode to write one, but had kind of like like a lot of us know, he procrastinated, <laughs> put it off, and then he 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 kind of admitted. Uh, he says I, I, he messed everything up. He says and offered to to fall on the grenade and write those ep- one of those episodes that nobody else liked to write, which is uh, a Doctor Light episode where where the Doctor doesn't show up very often. We saw that uh, most recently in in uh, New Who, uh, with Love and Monsters, Love and Monsters, and we're seeing this again. Uh, now with Blink. Uh, this one works much better. Oh, yeah. Well, I thought yeah. Love and Monsters worked fine up until the last act, and then the last act falls off a cliff. This right. one works fine <laughs> all the way through. Exactly. Yeah, this is, there, there's a reason this is considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, episodes of New Who, because it just is fantastic. It yeah, really is. It, it's, it, I, it's, it's probably, I don't know, I would, it could be considered the greatest episode of New Who, certainly the greatest standalone. Uh, that's not mm-hmm. like part of a larger story. It for me, it's definitely one of the all time best of the whole series. Whenever I'm introducing Doctor Who to someone for the first time, if they know nothing about Doctor Who, this if they have a couple hours, I'll show them Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead. Yeah. If they only have an hour, I'll show them Blink. And right. even though the Doctor's barely in it, they get what Doctor Who is about, and they have a really fun time watching it with me. Uh, even though it's a it's a doctor and companion light episode, neither the doctor nor Martha is in this hardly at all. It, it, yeah, uh, there's so much it, it, we're going to talk about uh, in this, but you, the 
the, this episode in 2009 was voted number two among fans uh, after the Caves of Androzani, which I think is an interesting uh, fact. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I would put this ahead of the Caves of Androzani. Just, I mean, I, I like Caves of Androzani. That's the fifth Doctor's regeneration story. If in case you're wondering. But I, I think this is more enjoyable just as a viewing experience. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll, and, I'll agree. And then I'll later agree. on, it was uh, it was second to Day of the Doctor, which I get why that is. I still think it's I think it's more yeah. enjoyable. That was a bit of a, a fun gimmick, Day of the Doctor. And, and we got to see, you know, mm -hmm. Tenet come yeah. back and all that sort of stuff. So I, I get why. And, and some of this depends on that was that was a little more recent and people's minds yeah. and so maybe they they were putting that higher so in 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 terms of raw enjoyment experience of a standalone story the only thing that parallels and a uh, well, one-parter the only thing i'm not so i'm excluding classic who which is just a different flavor of television but of new who the only standalone story that ranks up there with blink for me is midnight which just is a companion light story yes yeah, yeah. the companion separation this is a TARDIS separation story. Uh, if you want to, if you want to look to at it in that in those category. level, <laughs> yeah. <To> a... <laughs> but uh, yes, actually, a lot of people when they talk about um, the spookiest or the scariest uh, episodes, some a lot. Of, I I always thought the Weeping Angels were the creepiest of all the uh, oh, yes. Who villains, but some people think Midnight is creepier. Which mm -hmm. I, I I you know I'll grant that <laughs> it is pretty darn creepy. But uh, I I'm looking forward to us talking about that uh, in the not too distant future. What what makes the Weeping Angels creepy, and this is something Doctor Who, especially New Who, does a lot, is it takes something quotidian and tries to make it scary. So something just from ordinary life, like blinking, and then it's and and it and it then it preys on that because there's no way not to blink in the long term. We are biologically programmed to do that. And so you, you're put in the position of imagining yourself not being able to do something on pain of your life that you have to do. And that's what drives the fear factor, as well as the, just the oddness conceptually of these things that don't move actually are moving when you can't see them do it. Well, that's that's kind of like the old fear where you you turn, you know, it's at night and you turn off the light in a room and it's kind of dark and spooky. And all of a sudden you get that chill down your spine, like there's something in here and I got to get to the <laughs> back to the light. Yeah. Right. That uh, lizard part of our brain that uh, is uh, aware. Away. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so I, actually, I want to talk a little bit about the Weeping Angels as a villain. Uh, a brilliant part of this whole story is that the angels are stoned when no one is looking. Okay, that's established. Or when mm -hmm. someone is looking. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, the angels are stoned when no one is uh, when someone is looking, they when no one is looking is when they're they can move. But when when the audience is looking and no one in the in the story is, they're still stoned. In other right. words, that's making us part of the angel universe. Mm -hmm. and, and whenever the weeping angels are in an episode, no matter which episode We've we never see them move. They're always we're always part of the that that universe, which makes it all the creepier for, for us to take part in it. There may be an exception to that, but it, if so, it's very brief. I think there may be a Weeping Angels episode where we like see one sliding across where the characters can't see it, but we can see an angel like sliding yeah, across see, I, from I, I one place to another. Something like that, too, or you see them kind of move a little bit or something. I think there was one where we saw, uh, like like in this one, we see a shadow move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there was the Angels Take Manhattan episode where we had uh, some, uh, we had the big Statue of Liberty one, which don't get me. Yeah, we'll, oh, we'll talk yeah. about that when we get to that. <laughs> uh, this is this is the archetypal, archetypal and archetypical and best Weeping Angels episode. It's a little bit downhill from here, and then it kind of nosedives towards the end. Like all great vi TV show villains, they are always best right in the beginning, and then they end up getting watered down eventually out of overuse. Well, uh, overuse, and then they have to kind of ramp up what the alien does, you know, so that in because you know, like with the Weeping Angels, they go from just they shoot you back in time and live off your life that you would have lived to actually killing people eventually. Right. It, it, yes. So, um, one of the things that I have to mention, there's so much background about this that's been revealed, you know, that especially when Moffat has talked about it, there's a, 
interview he did with Doctor Who magazine in 2013, where he talked about his inspiration for the Weeping Angels. And I want to read the quote from him on that. He says, uh, there was an abandoned church with a dangerous graveyard. Yes, dangerous, officially dangerous. The gates were chained up and there was a big sign saying, keep out dangerous structure. Well, could you have resisted? I went and peered through the bars and there among all the ancient leaning gravestones was the statue of a lamenting angel. The way it looked at me, I felt sure this was the dangerous structure in question, a dangerous statue hidden in a graveyard. A few Christmases later, long after Blink, we were back at the hotel. My son Joshua and I went for a walk past the church and it all came flooding back. Hey, I said, you want to see the original weeping angel? I took him to peer through the bars of the damaged graveyard. Dad, there's no angel there. There wasn't. There really wasn't. We left fairly quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's one of two inspirations for this story. Um, the, the the when he saw the weeping angel statue is the danger uh, that he interpreted as the dangerous structure. So that's where that the idea for the monster came from. But there's another thing that this story is inspired by, which is a a short story that Stephen Moffat wrote for the 2006 Doctor Who annual called What I Did on My Christmas Holidays. And we'll talk about that at the end of this episode a little bit, just to let you know how it compares to Blink once we've refreshed your memories about what Blink is like. But basically, the uh, the, the lamenting or weeping angel incident at the church and What I Did on My Christmas Holidays are the two inspirations that feed into Blink. So now that we've spent this time on the preliminaries, let's talk about the episode itself. Yeah, um, it and s starts with Sally Sparrow being a criminal and breaking in and trespassing yes. on someone else's property. Who climbs into a spooky house in the middle of the night <laughs> of a rainy, wet night? <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> Nothing good ever happens with that, especially if you're on TV. Uh, so it, the, one of the interesting things about this opening, this cold open, you know, the, the teaser is that there's no spoken dialogue. Everything is just on, you know, on screen, Sally exploring. She's a photographer who, and, and like, you know, there are people who I, I know who do this. You see, sometimes they work online, who like to go into these strange places at the odd hours and take interesting photos of abandoned oh, yeah. places. Uh, and that's what she's doing. A, a, an example of that that's kind of relevant out here in California is the Salton Sea. Uh, the Salton Sea is a sort of semi-artificial lake that has seen better days. It's out in the desert. It's in Imperial Valley. And they in the 50s, they were going to turn it into a resort, and they built these communities around it to prepare for all the tourists. And then the lake went downhill, and it started to smell and have algae blooms, and that dampened the tourist industry. And now you have all these, like, rusted, rotting communities out there, and people will go out and take pictures of this stark, beautiful desert scenery with the remnants of these dreams from the 50s rotting in them. And it's it makes for compelling photography. Well, you, you see a lot of people do that, too, with uh, like old malls as malls, you know, die off and get closed. People will go in and take pictures of them as the same kind of thing. You know, they're deteriorating. They're rotting away, basically. And people take all these pictures and videos inside there. Uh, I think the penultimate uh, version of that or not penultimate, but the ultimate version of that is when people go into the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Yes. And, and photograph yes. some of the, the city, the city of Chernobyl. That's pretty wild. And climb up on the Russian woodpecker. <laughs> exactly. You could find out all about that on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World podcast. We talked about it. So uh, but the this house that that um, Sally goes to is called Wester Drumlins. Wester, W-E-S-T-E-R, Drumlins. That's the name of the house. Which which we think we've now cracked as a group of Americans discussing it and researching it before the show. Thanks to some Googling Father Corey did, it seems like a drumlin is a hill. And so West Wester Drumlins would mean something like the Western Hills house or something. Yeah, exactly. It, it's something like... Uh, you, you, I think there are there are more and more of that England than we do here in the States where they'll name a, a property after a, a feature on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the actual location is called Fields House that the BBC, mm -hmm. that the production company used. And it's it's been used several times in Doctor Who. Most recently, it was the house that Bill moved into during uh, season 10. In when the season she got flatmates. Yes. And there was the episode Knock Knock. Uh, where the 
they had the bugs in the walls that suck people into the woodwork. If you remember that one, mm, we talked about yeah. that a couple of years ago. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so it's the same house, and they've used it for several different episodes. And so, it, they, they they tend to um, reuse some things, and it's it's kind of fun sure. fun to, to see them in different ways. I like how uh, Kathy Nightingale, once they introduce her character, says it's the Scooby Doo house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, very Scooby Doo. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I found a website where uh, someone went and visited it in 2010 and took pictures. And that's what it looks like. It looks run down, falling apart. Uh, the doctor's message, which we'll talk about in a sec, to Sally uh, is still on the wall, except it's been painted over, except for the word no, which I'm not sure what that means. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, that word didn't want to be painted over. Yes, uh, that's that's kind of interesting. So she goes in, she's taking photos, and then she... She sees a bee on the wall behind the wallpaper. I like the way they did it here. It was nice. It was nicely put together. It's actually better than what they do in the story. She sees the letter B where the wallpaper is just naturally peeled back. And of course, once you see the letter B underneath wallpaper, it invites you to pull it further. And so we get this stage, stage by stage reveal of the message, which is beware the weeping angel. O oh, and duck, really duck, Sally Sparrow, duck now, love from the doctor, 1969. <laughs> yeah. So so the after the Sally Sparrow duck now, she ducks and a rock comes flying in uh, and, and, and bangs and, the wall and bangs the wall. And she turns around and there's a statue outside, a winged angel with its hands covering its face. You know, the interesting thing about the angels here is, is throughout all of the episode, right up to the, the climactic moments. The angels don't appear scary. They don't have that no. fang face. Yeah. They always just look like regular weeping, you know, the, the normal weeping angel, lamentation angel that we see. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, it, it, it keeps that scariness. In, in this case, when she turns around and the angel has its hands over its eyes, it's like, I didn't do it. You're right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's almost childlike, which is that makes it creepier and yeah. so uh sally now uh goes after the uh the credits sally's at her friend's she house. commit she commits her second crime she breaks into <laughs> her friend's house in the middle of the night right <laughs> and she goes and then there's a, a, a monitor like a, a, a tv with actually a bunch of screens all showing the doctor and the doctor's on the screen speaking <clears throat> having a conversation as if the uh as, as he's if he, talking to the camera talking to the camera as if he's having a conversation with someone except you only hear his side of it and of course we know this is going to be the conversation he has with sally at the at the end of the episode yeah and he's saying don't blink blink and you're dead the screens are many of them are frozen at different points in the conversation and some of them you can see martha leaning in to talk to the camera as well right and so she's at her friend's house kathy nightingale uh, and she, she's waking her up in the middle of the night, and they're going to, and and then she meets she also Larry. Meets, yeah, <laughs> uh, that's quite a meeting. Uh, Larry, who's uh, wandering around uh, unclothed in the middle of the night, not not expecting to see Sally there. He's like coming back to bed from the kitchen or the bathroom, and he stops and turns to see. Or I guess from the bathroom, and he stops and turns to see Sally Sparrow, and says, "Not sure, but really, really hoping." pants <laughs> and she says no <laughs> and so uh so kathy and sally go to wester drumlin's uh in the daylight this time because that's more sensible although apparently not less dangerous and uh they as they're going in they're saying like hey and, and, and- and, and K- Kathy's getting into it. It's like it's that it, she has this kind of Nancy Drew vibe going, and it's like, oh, girl investigators. Yes. Hey, Sparrow and Nightingale, that so works. And Sally says it's a bit ITV, and, and Jimmy, which I yeah. love because this is BBC. Uh, wh- yeah. What do you think it, uh, uh, that's all about there? So obviously, it's the BBC. Since this is a BBC show, it's kind of a playful swipe at their competitor, ITV. ITV was known for doing science fiction shows, uh, including Sapphire and Steel. Sapphire and Steel starred Joanna Lumley and David McCallum. It was sort of a rival to Doctor Who back in the 70s, and it was about these two 
interdimensional agents. Sapphire was Joanna Lumley and Steele was David McCallum. And they would investigate strange happenings and put things to right. So it's kind of like the doctor. They drop in these random situations, random places where something weird was happening and fix it all up. So it's kind of a, 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 a two person version of Doctor Who. Um, and uh, and so Sapphire and Steel, Sparrow and Nightingale, girl investigators, <laughs> something spooky going on here. Huh. Be interesting to check that out, though, because those are both good actors. Yeah. Yeah. It also, like Doctor Who, it had a, a weekly serial format, so it would have multi-part episodes. Uh, I would, I, someday we should do an episode where we talk about all the shows that were inspired by Doctor Who, that, that, that have definite lineage. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like Quantum Leap is, is, is very similar mm -hmm. to that. Inspector Space Time? Uh, yeah. that one. <laughs> Don't forget Inspector Space Time. He's awesome. <laughs> of course. Of course. So Sally and Kathy are kind of talking about, you know, Kathy asked her, why do you come here anyway? Like there's a strange uh, falling down house. And Sally says, I love old things. They make me feel sad. And I can't say, what's so good about sad? Well, it's happy for deep people. And I love yeah. that line. <laughs> <laughs> there's something true about that. Sad is something... happy for deep people. Yeah. yeah. Because there can be a kind of nostalgia, like mm -hmm. and, and like when you're looking at photos of the Salton Sea or a rundown mall or something like that. and Yep. remembering what it used to be and so uh kathy's very creeped out by this whole situation and there's a someone rings the bell at the door and <laughs> kathy's who, who could it be it could be a burglar yeah. <laughs> a, who rings the doorbell <laughs> well not only that what would a burglar like to steal what in this old <laughs> rundown house yeah. so so kathy stays behind no, you, yeah, you i'll stay here just real... in case realistic scary it's it's a, a drug dealer would be possible but the drug dealer probably wouldn't ring the doorbell um a, a a a policeman or land agent wanting to know why you've broken into this property would be a possibility yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> so uh so it's a it's a man uh there a young a youngish uh you know it, it, about sally's and kathy's age uh with a letter for sally sparrow but it's an old letter and from Doc Brown. Oh, I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they, they have this back and forth where uh, he, he verifies it's her. And just as she, he tells her, oh, it's a letter from Catherine Wainwright. But before, before she was married, she was Kathy Nightingale. Bang. There's like a noise in the background. And that is when Kathy is touched by the weeping angel and sent back to 1920, 1920. in the hull uh, in, in England, in a field so of grazing cows. A rural rural place distant from London. Right. And then uh, Sally is sort of freaked out. She's, she's you know, is she this... does not, she does not know Kathy is gone at this point. Right. She thinks it's first, it's a joke. And I don't think she's opened the letter just yet. But she's sort of running around looking for Kathy, and the guy's like, "I'm just trying to give you this letter." Um, and he and we, gets kind of freaked out and leaves. Right, and we we keep switching back and forth between Kathy, who's freaked out in this field, like suddenly I was in the middle of London, and now I'm suddenly in in this field in Hull, uh, and she runs into this young man Ben, who's reading a newspaper there, uh, and he she ends up like wandering off because she doesn't know what what is going on. I love the idea as like. Um, he starts following her and she's like, are you just going to keep following me? He's like, yep, I think so. <laughs> He's just like, matter aren't, of fact, aren't yeah. you going to stop? No, I don't think so. <laughs> and then as Sally opens the letter and she sees the photographs inside, she sees her friend, Kathy, but from 1920 and then with the children, children and grandchildren as an old elderly woman. And then there's a letter and she kind of throws it down. And it turns out that the young man who handed her the letter is her grandson. Um, yeah. She made she pr made him promise to bring the letter on this very date at this very time. Which how did which, Kathy know the very moment in time on which she should ring that bell? Well, she knew. I pres I mean, she could have looked at her watch shortly before. We don't see her do that, but she knew what time of morning it was when they broke in. I mean, that would be seared in your memory. That's true. After an event like this. Um, <clears throat> what I found interesting, I really like the time cutting mon montage between 2007 and 1920. And just, we were jumping back and forth here. 
it's very effective as it as it plays out. It hits these different emotional beats where you have Kathy or uh, Sa- Sally's shock as she's realizing what's happening. And she says, this is sick. This is totally sick. Um, and then you have this budding, you have this initial confusion on Kathy's part, but then a hint of budding romance with with the guy. And then you get to see literal snapshots of her future life and her her children and her grandchildren. And it's 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 really touching. I was I was also confused a little bit by her name, because obviously Catherine Wainwright, Wainwright is her married name. So that's the name of the guy she marries is Wainwright. And and she's she was known, though, as Kathy Nightingale, her her uh, maiden name to Sally. But then they also refer to her as Catherine Costello Nightingale. And I, why is she Costello Nightingale and why doesn't she use Costello? Uh, and so I wasn't I wasn't sure how that got in there. But could that, um, could that be? Uh, I know there are some um, high, some hyphenated cultures, British like names. Hyphenation, well, hyphenation, because I know there's some cultures where uh, the child will take kind of like the middle name will be the mother's maiden name, and the last name will be will be the father's name. It could be an unusual middle name, given that it's a masculine form. But maybe that's it. I was trying to think of like hyphenated names, like you know David Hyde White or something. But if it was that, you should say Hyde White every time. It's not like it, it's not like in Spanish where if someone's name is Jose Alvarez Jimenez, you would call him Jose Alvarez most of the time and then add Jimenez on formal occasions. Right, right. I think it's I think what Father Corey said is probably the that, that case where it's a middle name based on a family last name. Um, one of the things that, that strikes me about this throughout the episode is the way that the shots are framed when we know that the, the the people, usually Sally and somebody, are being viewed by the angels. So we, we see them as we're looking through stuff, through window frames and through doorways and around corners. The one scene where when Sally's going to the police station later, as the camera on the on the crane goes up, it's sort of behind a tree almost as if we're looking at her from from hiding. Uh, and it, I think, again, that. That really raises the creep yeah. factor on, angel, on this episode. Angel monster POV. Yeah, I, I mean, the, so it's not just the the, the story, the, the script that it was so brilliantly done in this, but but also the directing in this was so good. I have to say, it really it really does pull from a lot of the kind of the classic horror tropes that you'll see, like you know Hitchcock mm-hmm. and so on would use. Yes, yes, it's brilliant in that way, and that. Uh, when you mentioned like Kathy going back in time, I do like it later on when when Sally is sort of finding Kathy's uh, gravestone because great- Kathy had died twenty years previously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Nineteen eighty seven. Yeah. She she had put her uh, birth date at nineteen oh two, and then she realizes doing the math, she went back in nineteen twenty. Oh, you told him you were eighteen years old, you cow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she was really twenty years old. Yeah, it's so funny. Uh, it was- one of the things, I guess, a bigger deal back then. Yes, yes. It's it's kind of interesting throughout this that all the times when Sally is alone among the statues or on the weeping angels, they never take her. You know, as she goes upstairs and wanders around, and the, she sees the three weeping angels in that hallway. She has her back to them. She uh, she quite obviously blinks at points. She doesn't know not to blink yet, but they never take her. And I'm kind of curious about yeah, it's because of reasons uh, uh, yeah i guess so uh it's it's sort of the story the story i mean for a story this good i i'll, I'll give him this yeah I, I know <laughs> i know i mean it, it it increases the creep factor because it makes them unpredictable and one of the things i was thinking about is we also they eat people and they just eat i mean that's the reason they do this and so they just ate kathy so maybe they're hungry r- right right well, one of the things I was thinking about is we we never know the angels' motives from their own perspective, their own words. We only, have, like I said, we only ever see them as stone. And so it's always attributed to them, usually by the doctor. And so they, they become like a force of nature, like an, like, like an animal. Like we just, we don't know their motives. We don't know why they do something now and not later. They just Ooh. do it. Here is an idea um, for why they don't eat her. It's be, so she when she's upstairs with the three angels, one of them has the TARDIS key in its hand. 
and she takes the TARDIS key. Maybe the angel was giving her the TARDIS key so that she could lead them to the TARDIS, because that's what they that's something they want is the TARDIS. I think that's a good point. Uh, also, the TARDIS's lock is apparently a Yale lock. Uh, so Yale uh, used on a good space time vehicles throughout. Uh, that's all the that's what the chameleon circuit says. It's we know <laughs> we know from the first Doctor's time though. It's it's uh, it's um, uh, biomechanically imprinted to the TARDIS crew, and only they can open it. Otherwise, it'll blow up. Right, right. Uh, oh, thankfully, that's not the case this time. Uh, so the the uh, the angels are in this one only show up in places where you expect them to be, like cemeteries or gardens. Uh, or on the side of a church, for instance. They don't show up at the DVD shop or at her home. I thought that was also another interesting aspect of of the way the angels are portrayed in this episode. Sally is sort of settled on this idea that Kathy is gone and that somehow she's travel, been sent, traveling back in time. And she goes to, she needs to go tell Kathy's brother, Larry, uh, who's working at the DVD shop, and tells him he, she went away for a work thing, which I... It's a terrible delaying tactic, but what else are you going to tell them? Like, when she doesn't come back from the work thing or from work calls and asks, where's Kathy? That's, they're going to see, you know. It, it would be a little dif difficult to tell him the truth, even if you give him the letter and the photos and say, here's what your sister, here's what really happened to your sister. You're, you're just going to have to deal with the massive police investigation after and, that. And of course, at, the, at that time, it's, you know, she doesn't know that it's the angel that does it. So it's just all of a sudden she disappeared to 1920. How? Yeah. Mm. And, and Kathy, Kathy may not have known. The angel may have touched her from behind and she never even exactly. saw it. Exactly. That's right. That's right. So uh, in the DVD shop, we, we see how that the doctor, we see the doctor on this video again. The doctor is an Easter egg, is this video of him on 17 different DVDs. But by the way, I got to say real quickly. DVD shop and ha having this as an Easter egg on DVDs. Doesn't that already sound dated after 12 years? <laughs> it's yes. so 2007. <laughs> yes. I mean, it it's could so be Blu-rays, but <laughs> now, now it now would be like an, an embedded GIF in the, the video <laughs> yeah. stream or something like that, you know? Right. An obscure YouTube video that's, that's, that's listed as private or something. Yeah. Uh, so the, <laughs> So the pause on the video keeps slipping, and I'm kind of curious about that. Like is again, it... for reasons. Okay, I was wondering if it was the doctor had done this intentionally to to make it keep. It could just be, you know, yeah. Again, for for the the purposes of plot. Yeah. So uh, so the, given that these Easter eggs have been on these DVDs for decades now, apparently, and uh, people will have discovered them because. You know, enough, given enough people watching enough DVDs, people will discover the Easter eggs. As you do. As you do. And what happens when that happens, when you do that, is you find other people on the Internet who also have the same interest in obscure things, uh, some Reddit subthread or, or something like that. And so Larry says, me and the guys are always trying to work out the other half of that conversation. And so I love this line. Sally says, when you say you and the other guys, you mean the Internet, don't you? And I'm thinking, that's basically <laughs> yeah. me and Jimmy and Father Corey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guilty we're, as charged. <laughs> we're working out the other half of uh, the conversation, talking about the obscure thing. That's us. <laughs> what, what I like about this is we now get an extended clip of the doctor's conversation in the Easter egg, and we get what has become a defining line for Doctor Who, uh, where the doctor is talking about how most people perceive time as a linear progression of events, but really from an objective, non-subjective point of view, it's more like a big ball of wibbly, wobbly, timey, wimey stuff. And so wibbly, wobbly, timey, wimey has now become a defining description of this show. And that line gets used all over the place in Who fandom and even in journalism talking right. about the show. Right. I've seen the uh, news reports on, uh, research, you know, uh, scientific research on time, and I've seen where scientists have referred to time as a wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. So I, I do stuff. I, yeah. I do love that uh, that that it's become that. Now, what what I'm disappointed is as we're recording this, none of us have a shirt that says that on. Because yeah. you can get them. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> well, let's. Speaking of shirts, later on when they're watching this video, 
the, the, the doctor has a line where he says, the angels have the phone box. And Larry says, oh, that's my favorite bit. I have that on a T-shirt. You yeah. can buy that T-shirt, by the way. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> Just Google I, the angels have the phone box uh, and then T-shirt, and you will find Ooh. it's available all kinds of places That's online. Awesome. Of course. <laughs> what, what, what I have been unable to find on a T-shirt is there is, uh, on, if you watch, I, and I haven't seen it in a long time, but if you watch The Big Bang Theory, Sheldon is known for having superhero T-shirts. Yes. And I've got a lot of superhero T-shirts, and Sheldon has one that has the Green Lantern Oath on it in the Interlac alphabet from the 31st century. Oh, that's <laughs> and it's, I cannot find the Green Lantern Oath Interlac t-shirt. Then you need to make it and put it in Cafe Press and sell it. Yeah, that's, that's how yeah. this works. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so it, in addition to the meta of the Doctor's conversation in the DVD Easter eggs, we also have some other stuff with the uh, Larry's co-worker, who's up at the front of the store, minding the storefront, and as you do, and he's watching a DVD because he's bored, and he's interacting with the DVD instead of Sally Sparrow, and he says to the DVD as she's leaving the shop, go to the police, you stupid woman. Why does no one ever, anyone ever go to the police? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so she, she does. does. She goes to the police. <laughs> right. Yeah, so uh, the... the, the uh... That guy is so great because he's apparently the shop owner. But when you see the list, mm. the character listing, his name's on the shop. And he's like the worst store owner ever because she comes in and he just kind of shushes her while he's watching this video. Like, it's yeah, I, I don't guy. have time for you. He's like comic book guy from, it's from the Simpsons. Simpsons. Yeah, Simpsons comic <laughs> book guy. He's not interested in, in, in becoming a, a, a wealthy bu you know, business owner. He just has this place to support his DVD habit. Come on, let's, let's be honest. Yeah. Uh, what, so well, what are and, about and that that may then play into by the end of the episode one year later this this DVD store is now the Sparrow and Nightingale DVD store. Well, Antiquarian Book and DVD store, which true, kind of shows uh, I think uh, uh, Sally's interest. What one of the things about the Doctor's uh, Easter egg video? The last thing I want to say uh, is that you can actually find, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. The whole Easter egg video it's on YouTube, so uh, uncut and um, in place, like without you, with without being part of the show, just separate from it. So somebody apparently got a copy of that out there. I'm sure it was probably like an extra on a DVD set some at some point. And that that reminds me, there's something similar to this as an Easter egg in The Simpsons. Um, periodically in The Simpsons, we'll see excerpts of a fictional movie starring an Arnold Schwarzenegger clone called McBain. And someone realized a few years ago, if you take all of the clips we've seen from the McBain movie and string them together, we get the actual plot of the McBain movie. Uh, so we have a friend of SQPN who's been on a few of our shows who who works on The Simpsons. I'm going to have to ask him about that one and uh, see if we can get him to talk about that on an yeah. episode of one of that our shows at some point. Yeah, yeah my let's <laughs> talk. That'd be fun. Yes, yes. We have to get Luis on and talk about some of The Simpsons. So, uh, so Sally goes to the cops. They think she's crazy at first, uh, and then de de Detective Inspector uh, Billy Shipton. Billy Shipton. He's he's about to like get rid of her because the the desk sergeant uh, is is called him up to get rid of this crazy girl. And then he comes up. He sees her. Sally is Whoa. a cute girl. <laughs> Change of plans. <laughs> she, as he says, she's hot. And so uh, he he decides to show her, uh, and because she mentioned the house, Wester Drumlin's. He decides to show her this garage where apparently a whole and over the last couple of years, a whole bunch of people have driven to the house and then gone missing. Just like in Alternative 3. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. So why why were a whole lot of people going to this house? That's an interesting question. Uh, apparently to take break in and take photos. I mean, that seems to be the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some of them were actually is still in their car. The car was running when it when it uh, you know when they got taken by the by the angel uh, because they found the car running. So uh, I do like the uh, the he shows her the the TARDIS. He says, "Oh, it's an old style police box, except it's not quite right." He says that uh, the windows are the wrong size for a real police box. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Is, is that is 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 that a, a known fact that we're bringing out? 
Well, there have been different editions of the TARDIS over the course of time. And so it may have been a criticism of this one. And they're different sizes. Um, and so it may have been, a, and they have different features. Like in, in this one, you'll notice it has the St. John's ambulance symbol on it. And that it, that it had in the first Doctor's time, and Stephen Moffat brought it back to be a symbol of his time as showrunner. Um, but the other dif other details about the TARDIS will vary, including the window size. And so it may have been a criticism that some people made of this model was saying, hey, the windows aren't, don't match. Well, and uh, but the, when you look at existing police boxes, because there are still a few, a handful left in uh, Britain, including one in, on Google Maps where you can go into it and it enters into the, the David Tennant Ooh. style console room. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that is a good one. But um, they, they don't look the same as the classic TARDIS. And I think that was actually a, I seem to recall reading something where that was actually a choice by the BBC at one point when they decided they needed to trademark the TARDIS image. Mm -hmm. oh, that they yeah. purposely made it just derivative enough that they could then say this is our police mm -hmm. box. That's that's it's, a good point. It's neat that they reference it on the show, though. To it's another nice made a bit. But then in an even another made a bit, I love how direct Billy Shipton is with with Sally. It's like <laughs> yeah. no, no, you're missing the big picture. The big question is. Will you have a drink with me in five minutes? <laughs> and she was like, why? Because life is short and you are hot. Yeah. I love that line. <laughs> yeah. And then and then as she's talking to him, she accidentally has a she has a Freudian slip and refers to herself as Sally Shipton for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Don't look at me. Don't look at me. <laughs> Don't look at me. I'm walking away. I may just answer the the the, the call when you call me. Definitely call me though. Yeah. Now, <laughs> so she walks off and Billy is left there, turns around. If you turned around and saw a bunch of weeping angel statues where they weren't a second ago, like literally, would One you not go screaming the for the hills? <laughs> yeah. You might, but you might blink first to see if your vision clears up. <laughs> By the way, that's one thing I liked. You know, you're talking about how they, they shot some of this this uh, episode. There are a couple of times, and I think Billy was one of them, and I know uh, Sally was one of them, where they zoomed in on the eyes just as they blinked. And that was such an effective, okay, so, you know, they're, they're building up to this, this moment of, uh, of something's going to happen. Right. It's the blink. Also, we see um, the, before, he, before the, Billy gets zapped, we see the angels trying to get into the TARDIS. So now we know this is something they want. And it thus may be why they gave the key to Sally Sparrow to help find it. Right, right. And because we'd seen this, the uh, weeping angels outside the police station. Uh, on the church across the street, Sally sees them. She blinks. That's that blink. And then they're gone. And she's like, okay, now I'm going crazy. Then we have the reverse angle on that shot. And they're on the ledge outside the window where she is. And that's like, oh, creepy. So so Billy is now back in 1969. Right, where she runs. Where he, We he, finally see the doctor and Martha for the first time yep. live. And we learn we're before July of 1969 because the moon landing hasn't happened yet. Right. <laughs> and the doctor's got this wibbly wobbly time detector he's made out of something or other. Looks like there's and, like a lunchbox in there and yeah, other stuff. Right. egg beater or something. And <laughs> and he and he talks about how it's it's this timey wimey detector. Yeah, and, it dings and, when there's stuff. He says, mm -hmm. and yeah. it can boil an egg at 30 paces whether you want it to or not. Actually. So I've learned to stay away from hens. It's not pretty when they blow. <laughs> yeah, I love that line. <laughs> so, and then Martha tells him, as he's explaining the, the, uh, how the weeping angels work and they live off of potential energy, Billy's like, what in God's name are you talking about? And Martha says, trust me, just nod when he stops for breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell she's definitely not impressed with the doctor at that moment. Yeah, and 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 this by the way, this gets worse with Matt Smith. <laughs> he nod when he stops for breath. Uh, so I, I like how so we now get an explanation from the doctor of what the weeping angels are, also known as the lonely assassins. They're from the dark time at the beginning of the universe. Um and he says they're the only psychopaths in the universe to kill you kindly. They just right. move you to the past and let you live to death. Of course, later on, as you said, they they are they do not kill you kindly anymore. Uh, they yeah. they start to get that nasty. does eventually change. Yeah, yeah. Um, At least and, in some cases. 
Mm-hmm. But in other cases, I mean, when they zap Rory and Amy, they just move them to the past to feed off their yep. temporal energy. Right. Uh, and it's, so also the we have this uh, message, another message from the doctor to Sally through time by sending it with Billy, who he knows is going to live till the night that he meets uh, Sally. And so she goes oh, man. What, to see him. What a what a burden that would be to know I'm going to live and to, to to the year 2007. This girl is going to come to me and it's going to rain and I'm going to die that night. Right. After I deliver this message. I mean, wow, that's heavy. He says, um, the doctor says, I'm sorry. I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> yes. Yep. I, I really then, like this scene, actually. I like yeah. So how Sally stays with him and we have mm-hmm. like the rain because he says, you know, it, it will it'll be raining when I die. So we have the rain outside the window and then we change the scene. We doesn't we don't see anything about him dying. We just see the bed that he was in is empty. The sheets yep. are gone and the sun mm-hmm. is out and the music starts and it's like, right. OK, now Sally is determined. Dum, 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 dum. We're, we've had our pause. Right. The emotional moment. Now we're back into plot mode. Right. And we find out that. Billy uh, ended up becoming a DVD publisher, mm-hmm. and uh, Sally uh, stays with him uh, until he dies. And he finds out that the 17 DVDs that the Easter egg is found on are the 17 DVDs that Sally owns. All and only the DVDs that she owns. Yeah. And yet she never found these Easter eggs because she wasn't looking for them. And, and the, good, the good news for Billy is he got out of the DVD market before it fell apart. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, Sally only has 17 DVDs in her, her whole collection. Those are the only ones she owns. And Larry is aghast that you only own 17 DVDs. <laughs> well, again, that, that seems that seems so archaic to us today because I know people who don't own any DVDs anymore. It's all Netflix and Amazon and everything else. So, But for this age, it was it was normal for young people to have more than 17 DVDs. It's interesting that so the, she because of the time paradox we have here where and this this episode essentially involves a bootstrap paradox because all of the information the doctor has in 1969 came to him from Sally Sparrow in 2008 a year One later year. than this yes. yeah and so there's so that information never originates anywhere the doctor gives get, got it from Sally she he gives it to Sally she gives it back to him and it just loops in time that way and Billy, playing out this, uh, has put the Easter eggs on exactly the DVDs she has, but because she's not into DVDs, she never goes looking for the Easter eggs and never finds them. So that so Larry is the is the the key uh, in that one. So she says to Larry, "Do you have a portable DVD player?" And he says, "Of course, because of course." Uh, and then she says, "I want you to meet me." And they go to the. Why do they go to the house? <laughs> like, why do they go to Wester Drumlin's? It's like, go to her house, go to her apartment, look at the video there. But like you say, Jimmy, because for plot. Yeah. <laughs> for plot. Uh, and I, this can is head, where... I can headcanon this a little bit because it is where part of the conversation across time is written on the wall. Mm-hmm. Right, right. She wants to be in the place where this this in the place where it happens. So to... And she and, and it it's a way of showing him, look, see, I'm, you know, and right. This is here. This is plays into whatever we're dealing with. Yes. In in where <laughs> this is where we get the line. Uh, you live in Scooby Doo's house, which is uh, which is great. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so they 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 start watching the DVD. Uh, this is where the the doctor starts interacting with her, and Larry's freaking out because this is playing out in front of him, and he starts and writing it's such down a the transcript. Revela- revelation to him. It's like, oh, I always wondered what this the is opposite <laughs> of that line was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, he says, "Look, I've got a transcript. See everything he says." Uh, and what I love is, is that this is the transcript that the doctor is going off of that that Larry's producing. And I, I also like the little bit that Larry knows shorthand. For, for whatever reason, he can do shorthand, uh, which makes it plausible that he's getting the entire conversation. But it's just it's just it's funny that for. Some strange reasons. Well, for, for plot reasons, he knows what? shorthand. Well, yeah, I, I, just, I want to imagine that he like worked as a secretary for a brief period of time or something. You know, I just love that. Well, I love the fact that she's sitting there. How is he, how are you doing this? And the doctor's looking at her on the screen, going, "Look to your left." 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, <laughs> I imagine we were like online. There's all kinds of theories about that. I imagine some sort of political statement. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, no, you dummy. It's you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, uh, so then he's like, okay, that's it. That's where it ends. So I imagine the reason the, the transcript ends is because, they're coming for you. It's like, oh, yeah. great. This yeah. is it. Good luck. Uh, yeah, good luck. Yeah. And she says, she tells Larry, don't take your eyes off the statue. Don't blink. And that's actually what stops the transcript, right? She tells him, don't take your eyes off the statue. So he can't be writing any, any anything else. So, but she tells him, don't blink. How can you not blink that entire time she's running around? And he's like, I'm going to blink. Well, she, uh, she was, that drove me nuts because she's almost, inconsiderate this poor guy as she's poking around in the house and he's trying everything he can not to blink so he doesn't get zapped here mm -hmm. grab the back of his shirt and guide him backwards as you're walking yeah yeah and then as you go out the door of that room close the door <laughs> that's pretty easy <laughs> i i was i was looking on the Riker googling twitter channel of things commander Riker googles and one of one of the one of them was can you defeat weeping angels by closing one eye at a time <laughs> <laughs> might work <laughs> i don't want to test it but uh yeah so she finds you know they, they can't get out the weeping angels have blocked the doors and the only way out is through the basement so they they go to the basement where three angels are surrounding the tardis with a single light bulb and they start messing with the light because as right. soon as it goes dark, they can move. Right. Uh, I did forget to mention that at one point, uh, Larry does blink. And and as soon as he blinks, he opens his eyes and there's the fanged weeping angel in front of him about to, to grab him. Now, that's not that, I remember. I still remember the first time I saw that I nearly jumped off my skin yeah, that... When, that, when that appeared on screen. Uh, so. Yeah, they're down in the basement and they, they're trying to get in. She's got the key. They're trying to put the light out so that in the darkness they can move. Uh, Sally and Larry get in. Uh, it's bigger than the inside. Uh, and then uh, there's a hologram of the doctor. It talks about a uh, emergency protocol. You have an emergency transport disc. It's one of the DVDs that happens to be the DVD in Larry's pocket, of course, which is glowing. And Good for one trip. Good for one trip. The angels start attacking the TARDIS, pushing it back and forth. Yeah, so they're like, we normally don't see this on Doctor Who. I mean, you see it all the time on Star Trek, where the bridge lurches and everyone goes flying. And and now the angels are like rocking the TARDIS back and forth. And I love the heck, the, the way that, again, a, a good directing choice, as the light, the, the light bulb in the basement is blinking on and off, which is another sort of blink, by the way. It's blinking on and off. You see... The the, uh, the angels go into darkness, and then you see the TARDIS move because it's dark. So you don't see them, but you see the TARDIS moving. So it's real, it's it's effective. And then the TARDIS starts to dematerialize without uh, Sally and Larry in it, with the angels yeah. around them. Oh, so which is which is again for plot reasons, but it was so it the TARDIS takes off and leaves Sally and Larry in the midst of these angels, right? Yep. But because they were they were surrounding the TARDIS on four sides, so they could have their eyes open because they couldn't see each other. Uh, but uh, when the TARDIS disappears, they suddenly see each other, and now they're quantum locked, as the Doctor says. And they, they're stuck there. They can't move uh, until the light... So unless someone comes down and, and turns one of the <laughs> angels away from the other... Or, or turns off the light. The light bulb burns <laughs> out. Or... or <laughs> Yeah, power company turns frozen. off the power. Uh, there could be a number of different things. So th those they're not there forever. And then we so then we jump ahead to a year later. Uh, Sally and Larry now own the DVD shop, and like I said, it's a now an antiquarian book and DVD shop. And Larry hints that uh, you know, hey, do you think your obsession with the events here, and because she's been putting together a packet, the transcript, all the things that the doctor would need in order for him to to use it in the past. Although although she doesn't she's not doing it with that purpose. It's just it's just she's just putting together this stuff cuz she's obsessing about it. Right. And Larry, you know, suggests to her, do you think maybe you've put other parts of your life on hold, hint hint romantic things, yeah. you know, with your obsession with this? And she says, "We we're just co-owning a bookshop together or a DVD shop together." And she sort of puts the kibosh on him. Yeah, that's really implausible. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, you don't you don't co-own a book and DVD shop with a person of the same age and the opposite sex who is also single. <laughs> right. And it doesn't work that way. It's, there's more to it than that. So uh, Larry goes out to buy some milk. And as she's looking at the front window, she sees the doctor and Martha get out of a car. The doctor's holding a longbow. Martha's got a quiver of arrows. I, I like this idea. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what they're doing, but the migration has started. The the red there's the red hatching and there are four things in a lizard and that's all we know about yeah. this whatever the <laughs> yeah. doctor and Martha yeah. are something's doing. going on it, something we stop it. Exactly. <laughs> I, <laughs> I if it's very we if 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 I wonder if if there's a you know a big Finnish audio or something that tells that story I, I would love to see it not as far as I'm aware but I, this is a case of less is more we're just hinting at what's going on but not letting us know right is what makes it so fascinating. So from the doctor's timeline, this is before the events of this episode. He he has not, and he, he kind of points out, you know, I'm, I live a complex life. Things don't always happen in quite the right order, which is what we see later on on a bigger scale with River Song, which Moffat will write. It, it gets a bit confusing at times, especially at weddings. I'm rubbish at weddings, especially my own, which is another interesting, because of course the doctor was probably married because he had a granddaughter, right? We know that. Right. And and he also is married in his 10th incarnation at some point to Queen Elizabeth I. That's right. And we have more wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff with his wedding to River Song. That's right. Sally comes to the quick realization that as a time traveler, everything is, hasn't happened to him yet. And I love this, that she's sort of indulgent of him and he's indulgent of her. And this must happen to the doctor a lot, where he just runs into people who know him but he hasn't met yet. And this is this is this this is the first time that I mean it may have happened before in the show but this is the first time I can recall it happening and it's the setup for what they then do on a bigger scale with River Song because when he meets her she also is from his future and he doesn't know her. That's right. That's right. And so we have um she hands him the packet says one day you're going to get stuck in 1969 make sure you get this with you you're going to need it. And I'm sure what he does is he shoves it in one of those pockets in the trench coat because he's always yeah, got everything in that trench coat. Exactly. And then Billy comes back. For, I'm sorry. Larry comes back from getting the milk and she takes his hand. And, well, and it's there's more than that. The doctor it, and I didn't notice this the first time I first several times I saw this, but um, I can be kind of oblivious about such things. <laughs> but a friend of mine pointed it out when we watched it together. The doctor is given Sally Sparrow eyes at this hmm. moment and he's hmm. clearly when you watch it with this in mind he is clearly attracted to her and is thinking about her as companion material right and and it's at that moment larry comes back and she realizes what the doctor is thinking and <laughs> and deliberately grabs larry's hand as a way of saying no i'm staying here with this guy and hmm. so she i think women would pick up on that more so than us guys would, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But she has now that she's get, now that she's handed over all of this stuff, she has literally let go of her obsession and can move forward with other other parts of her life. And then she she literally says goodbye, doctor, you know, that at this point. And this is where most most episodes would end. But then we have the camera pans up. We see that the, the DVD store is now titled Sparrow and Nightingale Antiquarian Books, which is a nice touch. But the camera pans up to the top of the building where there's a, a grotesque, which we would, a lot of people call a gargoyle, is sitting on the roof. The gargoyle is specifically... Technically, to be a gargoyle, it has to have a water right. spout exactly. in it. That's what makes it gargle. It's an automatopoeia word. Right. And then, and then we have the doctor replaying the whole thing about the don't blink um, with a montage of public statues throughout presumably the london area we could assume but yeah. just random statues We'd, and and they're not all angels so any statue could be one of the right. lonely assassins as, as we see in the angels mm. take manhattan including the statue of liberty yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so jimmy i i promised we would come back to this uh this, yeah. this something from the doctor who annual in 2006 yeah time to pay that yeah. off so tell tell us about it in the, in the audience so occasionally in New Who, we have uh, episodes that are based on things that were originally from tie-in media. An example of that is Dalek, 
Another example of that is the lodger. And it turns out blink is the same thing. Uh, in the 2006 annual, uh, P Stephen Moffat wrote a, a short story called What I Did on My Christmas Vacation or My Christmas Holidays. And it's a uh, it's an essay by Sally Sparrow, except in the story, Sally Sparrow is not a young woman. She's a 12-year-old girl, and sh this is her homework assignment over her Christmas holidays because she got in trouble in school. And so as a punishment, she's supposed to write an essay of what she did over her Christmas holidays, and we get the basis of, of Blink. Now, the thing is, there are some differences. One difference, other than Sally Sparrow being a 12-year-old girl is it's the ninth doctor, not the tenth, because this the 2006 annual came out during the Christopher Eccleston era, so it was written for him. There are also pictures. It's an illustrated short story, so there are pictures of all this. Um, but the big difference is there are no weeping angels in it. That's why I said early on that the statue that Stephen Moffat saw and what I did on my Christmas holidays are the two inspirations of Blink. They both feed into it. Um, so what you have here is the doctor is stuck in the past. It's not 1969. It's like 1980 85. something, uh, 85. Yeah. Um, but he's stuck in the past because the TARDIS, when he got out of the TARDIS in 1985, the TARDIS burped and shot 20 years into the future. <laughs> and, and so he's, he's written on the wall underneath the wallpaper that wasn't there. In Sally's in a room of Sally Sparrow's aunt's house, where he was for a, that, a Christmas that, party, where he was at a Christmas party, yeah. and so he know he knows that Sally Sparrow is going to be in this room in the future, and uh, she and she's been ever since she was a little girl, she's been like peeling away at the wallpaper a little bit, just, and this is why the it doesn't work as well as in the show where you see the bee and that leads you to naturally start peeling the wallpaper back. In the story, she just kind of starts peeling the wallpaper just as a kid. Um, and But she finds a message from the doctor. It leads her to a series of additional things, that's, uh, including a VHS tape of the doctor and uh, also a photograph of the doctor holding a sign that says, help me, Sally Sparrow. And he to prove to her that what um, that this is all real, that this is not some kind of prank in one of the messages, he says, think of a number and go look at what's carved on the tree in the back of the garden. And it's the same number that she's thinking of. Um, and so we have a similar progression of messages across time, which lead to her getting the TARDIS and taking it to him uh, so that he doesn't have to wait 20 years to catch up with the TARDIS again. Also, we get a hint of her future, because how does the doctor get it, get this information? Um, again, we have a bootstrap paradox. He got it, apparently, from her future self at some point in the future when she was a spy on a rooftop in Istanbul and gave him a copy of her Christmas essay. Right. <laughs> that, she's been, that she knew that she would do because he told her about it when she was 12. Yes, the bootstrap paradox. You know, one of these, that brings up one of the interesting aspects of this is, you know, the doctor got sent back to 1969. He could have hung around for 40 some odd years and picked up the TARDIS when he got to it. But because he had Martha with him. Martha, Martha would have really loved that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Martha no would be either, it would be 70 some odd years old, maybe, uh, by the time they, they pick it up. Uh, but he also says he doesn't want to leave the TARDIS there for the angels to find, because if they ever get in to all of the potential time energy held in the TARDIS, time circuits, that would be a disaster. So that's so that sort of explains why he doesn't just wait, you know, being essentially. Yeah, immortal. there's a similar there's a similar line in the short story where he says he, he didn't want to wait 20 years and he didn't want to let other people mess with the TARDIS or something. But that didn't make any sense to me, because as soon as it's the, the TARDIS is not there for 20 years, so no one can mess with it in that period. And if he knows when it's going to reappear. He just has to be there at that moment before anyone else can get to exactly. it. Exactly. So, yeah, that would. So he, it works better in in the TV show than it does in the uh, short story. But it, it was a cute story. I, I did. I did enjoy that. Moffat has a uh, I think he did a good job writing about this, this little girl and in, in encountering this. I, I did like that. Yeah, it, it, it comes off as something written by a 12 year old. It, it does not sound fully adult. Right. Right. It, it, a bit of a precocious 12 year old, but <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, exactly. a bit of a. 
bit of a rude 12 year old. She refers to her aunt as my fat aunt. <laughs> yes, there are a couple of the things that she says there. Uh, he also refers to Eccleston as having big ears, uh, which is yeah. <laughs> for the poor guy. <laughs> so um, any other notes that uh, I've uh, we haven't discussed yet that you want to bring up before we finish up? I'm good. I I had the you know, I had my little tech glitch uh, when we were talking about Billy Shipton. Did you mention anything about the actor of old Billy Shipton? No, no, we didn't. So he looked familiar, and for good reason. He's he was in two episodes of Classic Who. His name is Lewis Mahoney, and he was in the third Doctor episode, Frontier in Space, as a newscaster. And then he was in a fourth Doctor episode called Planet of Evil, and his name was Ponty. Okay. okay. So I think I've been, seen him in other things, too. He's been in other yeah. things as well, obviously. Yeah. You know, Great Britain and small acting pool, etc. cetera. But uh, he's, he's, a, he's a classic cool alum. Excellent, excellent. Uh, one of the things I, I did want to mention was I really enjoyed uh, Carrie Mulligan as Sally Sparrow. I think she did great. She, she, she oh, would yeah. have been a great companion, actually. I would have liked Sally, Sally Sparrow as a... Uh, a doctor companion that would have been fun but uh so she's a, a lot of fun there and let's see i think that's about it uh so we could talk forever we, we this was a, a a little bit longer episode of uh <laughs> it's a doctor but because it's, it's so good there was a lot to talk uh, about yes yeah, exactly it was a great exactly and so uh we we really had that's a good our story and we're sticking to it <laughs> 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 but before we wrap up i want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who. And today we want to thank uh, Daryl M., William C., Jeremy S., Joanne M., uh, Joanne, you know who you are, and Christine G. <laughs> Through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows we do at SQPN. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What did you think of Blink? Of course I know what you think of Blink. You loved it! Uh, what do you think of our discussion of Blink? Uh, do you did do do we hit all the high notes? Was there more that you wanted to say? We'd love to hear your feedback on on Blink and on our discussion of Blink. Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page. Leave us some feedback there, or send us an email to Doctor Who at sqpn.com, and we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing. Delta and the Bannerman with the Seventh Doctor. <laughs> Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Well, thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, don't blink. Don't even blink. Blink and you're dead. They're fast, faster than you can believe. Don't turn your back, don't look away, and don't blink. Right. This is gonna be fun.